Genesis 20, we're on page 15. From there, Abraham travelled to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While he lived in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife Sarah, She is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, had Sarah brought to him. But God came to Abimelech in a dream and said to him, You're about to die because of the woman you've taken, for she is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though it is innocent? Didn't he himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother. I did this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I've also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I've not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he'll pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. Early in the morning, Abimelech got up, called all his servants together, and personally told them all these things, and the men were terrified. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, What have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you've brought such enormous guilt on me and on my kingdom? You've done things to me that should never be done. Abimelech also said to Abraham, What did you intend when you did this thing? Abraham replied, I thought, There's absolutely no fear of God in this place. They'll kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me, he's my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and cattle and male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, look, my land is before you. Settle wherever you want. And to Sarah he said, look, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. It is a verification of your honour to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, his female slaves, so that they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wounds in Abimelech's household on account of Sarah, Abraham's wife. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Abraham's been waiting a long time. If you count the years, it's been 25 years since God spoke to him and he obeyed. In that time, he's been waiting for land and air and blessing. He's travelled throughout the land promised by God. He's spent time with God, being reassured by God. He's experienced the deliverance of God. He's made a covenant with God. He's been declared right with God because of God's mercy. But for a bloke like me who struggles to get to lunchtime, 25 years waiting, and the promises are still there, and things have been moving slowly. Waiting can be hard, can't it? I don't know about you, but one of the things that struck me as I've been reading accounts of preparation for the Tokyo Olympics is, gee, these people have been waiting, these athletes who've devoted so much time. And the problem with waiting and the problem with waiting and the problem with waiting is that waiting can wear you down, can't it? You might have tangible reassurances. You might have experiences that encourage you but the waiting can make you wilt under the pressure. It can cause doubts. It can reveal problems. It can cause everyday life to wear thin. And at points, you might take matters into your own hands because God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it, does he? I think Abraham is in that kind of situation. He's been waiting a very long time. 25 years, and today we see that the waiting took its toll, he wilted and took matters into his own hands. Let me pray. Father, thank you for gathering us together today. I thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to travel back in history to the time of Abraham to see your utter consistency, your complete faithfulness, and to be reminded of our nature, even as your people, as we struggle 
to wait for your promises. Father, please work on us by your word so that we are a people who are able to wait because you always do what you say. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. Look there at verse one. From there, Abraham travelled to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur while he lived in Gerar. Uh, We need to always place ourselves geographically when we return to a book, don't we? That was one of the helpful things about Mary's talk then. We need to place where we are in terms of lie of the land and the Bible. Uh, If you look at this map here, you'll see uh, where Abraham was. Uh, If you return to Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, he was camped under some oak trees at a place called Mamre. And that was a pretty significant time for him, wasn't it? If you remember back to Genesis chapter 18, uh, one day God came for dinner. Can you imagine that, having God sit at your dinner table? On that very same day, God reassured him that he would come back in 12 months' time and Abraham and Sarah would have a son and he would fulfil his promise. And they were able to negotiate, weren't they, Abraham and God, as they looked down out of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham interceded on behalf of the possibility of some righteous people being there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham appealed to God's sense of justice and mercy and interceded on behalf of those people. That was a memorable time under the oak trees there at Mamre. Or for whatever reason, uh, they packed up their tents and they moved down to the Negev. Uh, you'll see it down there on the bottom corner. Uh, it's that desert region between Egypt and what's modern-day Israel. They wandered around there for a while and then they moved up and camped and settled in Gerar. That's the geography of the land. There's also a geography of the Bible. That's that clothesline that we saw earlier on. Next slide, please, Seth. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we saw the creation of the world by God. See, right back there at the beginning, God spoke and his people were created, Adam and Eve, and they dwelt with God in God's place under God's word. In Genesis 3, That's the next pillar, the the kind of slightly darker green one. Sin enters the world. Adam and Eve decide to call God's bluff. You're not going to do what you really say, God. We don't trust your word. And so they act as if they're God. Remember, that's the essence of sin, that I'm God and God's not. It's the attitude and action that says that. And funnily enough, God shows that his word is true. He did exactly as he said. He judged them. Sin entered the world and close behind came death, the judgment of God, separation from God. And as the fall happened in Genesis 4 to 11, we saw the spread of sin throughout the world and the consistency of God's word in judging humans and saving humans. So by the time we come to Genesis chapter 12, and that's that blue column there, we see that God intervenes in this broken world through a particular man and his family. A man called Abram who becomes Abraham. Through his family, God's going to roll back the brokenness of the world and bring his approval. And if you cast your minds back, you'll remember how much there was to recommend Abram for the job. A 75-year-old idol-worshipping man with no children. Nothing to recommend the man, is there? At all. Except that God stepped in. God stepped in and made a promise that through this man with no family at this age, God was going to roll back sin and bring blessing. God was going to bring his people to live with him again under the rule of his word. God made that promise 25 years ago. And Abraham and Sarah have been waiting. So by the time we get to Genesis chapter 20, Those comments by God at that dinner under those oak trees in Genesis 18, in 12 months' time I'll be back, Abraham, and you will have a boy. In in many ways, uh, many people say that at this point, uh, Abraham is showing every sign of growing as one of the pillars of the faith, isn't he? 25 years waiting, ticking all the boxes, interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, hitting all those key performance indicators that men of faith have. And then we read Genesis 20, verses 1 and 2. From there, Abraham travelled to the region of the Negev 
and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While he lived in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife Sarah, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, had Sarah brought to him. Did he really say that? Sounds horribly familiar, doesn't it? Even the verbs are the same. Travelled, settled, lived. Just cast your mind back to Genesis 12, verses 9 and 10. Abraham had just come into the land, the land that God said would be his family. He's back there in Genesis 12. Abraham had built altars at the north and the south and worshipped the Lord. They'd settled, the drought came, and Abraham did what any good pastoralist would do. He moved to the green fields of the Egyptian delta, and when he turned up there, the beauty of his wife caused him to create a lie, a best of half-truth. She's my sister. Abraham looked after himself then. Sarah was left to fend for herself the promises of God. Well, God had saved Abraham and Sarah at that time. His promises were reaffirmed. But if you look at Genesis chapter 20, verse 13, you'll see that this was actually Abraham's consistent foreign policy, wasn't it? Wherever we go, Sarah, at least play the game and say that you're my sister. And Genesis 12, Abraham was shown to be looking after himself. Genesis 20 is a man of faith doing exactly the same thing. Now at this point, it doesn't seem that the beauty of Sarah is the issue. It's not mentioned, is it? Unlike Genesis 12. But what is important is what Abraham has grown to be. He's married to Sarah. He's in charge of a travelling party that, you know, conservatively is probably estimated at close to a 1,000 people in the camp. He's got a massive pastoral empire, hasn't he? Massive pastoral investments, massive resources. Abraham is a threat wherever he goes, especially as a nomad with no land and no people. So this kind of man moves into your neighbourhood and you're Abimelech, the king of Gerar. What do you do? Well, you've got two options. And Abraham knows this and knows the threat. First, if you're Abimelech and you see these two foreigners who are married, well, you kill Abraham, you take Sarah, you neutralise the threat and you get everything. Or if the two foreigners are related, you negotiate with Abraham, you marry the sister, they become family and you get everything anyway without the bloodshed. Whichever of the options you take, Abraham's under threat, isn't he? He's a nomad. He knows his status. He knows that he is a threat to Abimelech and that Abimelech is a threat to him. He does not trust God to do what he promises. So he takes matters into his own hands, doesn't he? And he acts to preserve himself. Abimelech takes Sarah, the sister. In the time scheme of the Bible, Abraham has just witnessed, heard and affirmed his covenant with God. In Genesis 17 and 18, Abraham has said publicly that I will walk devoutly before you, Lord, all the days of my life, trusting and obeying you. God has just affirmed at the dinner table that within 12 months they will have a boy. Promises, evidence, care, and Abraham takes matters into his own hands, does he? Abraham is deciding that he is God and God is not, that he needs to take God's promises and make them happen because I don't know whether God can do as he promised. And the damage is massive. Look there at verse 3. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, you're about to die because of the woman you've taken, for she is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not approached her, so he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though it's innocent? Didn't he himself say to me, she's my sister, and she herself said, he's my brother? I did this with a clear conscience and clean hands. And God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I've also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I've not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. He'll pray for you and you'll live. But if you do not return him, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. 
What a mercy from God. Abimelech is not even part of Abraham's clan. He literally sits outside the family of God. What does God do? He still intervenes, doesn't he? Oh, we don't know the nature of the dream or the visitation, but it certainly communicated the truth, didn't it? And Abimelech responds appropriately and does so based on this crucial fact, I'm innocent. I acted on the facts in front of me. I have not slept with her. Now, if you pause and think at this moment, you can see how foolish Abraham has been. Abraham, you will have a son within 12 months. Abimelech sleeps with Sarah. Whose son is it? No DNA testing. No family trees that you can whip up immediately with computers and biology. Whose son is it? And what happens to the promises of God? Do you see the foolishness of Abraham? And Abimelech's been far more honourable than Abraham, hasn't he? Do you notice that? I'm innocent. I have clean hands. I have a clear conscience. He appeals to God on the basis of justice, doesn't he? Exactly the same foundation that Abraham used way back there in Genesis 18, but has now forgotten. Abimelech appeals. It's his life. It's the life of his people that have been threatened by Abraham's sin. Abraham... Sin has not just damaged his relationship with God. It's had a ripple out effect for a whole nation who acted with a clear conscience. And God acknowledges the truth of the matter, doesn't he? He reveals his own hand in the matter. It's a merciful hand, isn't it? I intervened, Abimelech, because I did not want you to sin. But now the matter is revealed. Abimelech must hand Sarah back or face the consequences. Now, Abimelech's response is striking. We were told uh, in Genesis 18 and 19 that the angels had to wake Lot up early in the morning and he still wanted to slumber, faced by the judgment of God. What does Abimelech do? Do you see that there in verse 8? He gets up early of his own accord, gathers the whole house on and says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. And they respond appropriately, don't they? The contrasts are obvious. Abimelech is innocent, relying upon the mercy and justice of God, the very things that Abraham had experienced daily and had now forgotten. Abimelech hears the judgment of God and responds immediately. Lot, who has the angels of God in his own household, is worried about his investments. But there is one thing that remains the same throughout it all, isn't it? The very same God, right? just and timely in his mercy. His character doesn't change, does it? It's constant. It's immovable. And we are reminded at that point that if these promises are going to come about, it's not through Abraham's wilting hands. It's going to be through God's steadfast character. And so Abimelech calls Abraham in. Look there in verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, What have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you've brought such enormous guilt on me and my kingdom? You've done things to me that should never be done. And Abimelech also said to Abraham, what did you intend when you did this thing? That's a pointed question, isn't it? They're reasonable questions from Abimelech. He's really done the inexcusable. His sin has endangered an innocent man's life and the life of the whole kingdom. It's a grievous sin. The contrast with Abraham's concern for Sodom and Gomorrah is striking, isn't it? He has sinned by looking after his own selfish desires at this point and not trusting that God can do as he promised. And look at his response. Look there in verse 11 to 13. Abraham replied, I thought there's absolutely no fear of God in this place. They'll kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother. She, she became my wife. So when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me, he's my brother. You know, ironic. Abraham assumed that there was no fear of God in this place, but the ruler had showed greater trust and fear of God than Abraham, hadn't he? You see, here is the essence of Abraham's sin. He did not fear God enough. He did not trust that God could do exactly as he promised 
even with God's track record, and Abimelech had shown him up. And then when you burrow down into those excuses, it's like you've hopped in a time machine and gone back to Genesis 3. All excuses. Verse 11, it's the vibe of the land. It just didn't seem comfortable. Verse 12, well, if you look at it from this angle, God, she really is my sister. Verse 13, in fact, it's God's fault because he made me wander. That's the essence of sin, isn't it? Abraham's waiting had taken its toll. He wilted under the pressure of waiting. He'd revealed his sin. He pushed him to sin. He completely avoids his own responsibility. And that despite the fact that at his own dinner table, God had reaffirmed his commitment. How could Abraham dare do this? Sounds a little familiar though, doesn't it? A little too close to home? This wilting while you wait? In the face of God's action in history? Abimelech obeys God. Look there in verse 14. I'm at point five on the outline. Then Abimelech took sheep and cattle and male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, look, my land is before you settle wherever you want. He didn't actually have to do that, did he? Did you notice that? God said, just hand Sarah back. He hands Sarah back and then gives Abraham all of this wealth and then says, Abraham, have your pick of the lands. That's grace, isn't it? You shower abundant giving on a man who has just endangered you and your household. You treat with generosity a man who has just treated you shabbily. You extend mercy to a man who has been merciless in protecting his own interests. And then you get even further. Look there in verse 16, and to Sarah he said, and I don't know if he's really just having a dig here, but look, I'm giving your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It's a verification of your honour to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. Again, it's grace, isn't it? He did not have to do this, but he wants to make a public statement that this woman has been untouched. The promises of God are protected. He pays an enormous amount of money at his own expense in order to vindicate Sarah so that when the paternity question comes up, it's definitely Abraham who's the father. And then you get to the last two verses, 17 and 18. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, his female slaves, so that they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wombs in Abimelech's household on account of Sarah. Abraham intervenes with God for Abimelech. God listens, God heals and pardons the whole household. And let me tell you, it's not because of Abraham's character, is it? Isn't that grace? Undeserved mercy that God would use the intercession of a man like Abraham in order to deal graciously with Abimelech? Isn't that grace? That God would use Abraham to intervene on behalf of another? You see, it's not Abraham's good character, is it, that answers this prayer. It's God's good character, God's mercy, God's intervention, and God's kindness. We're waiting too, aren't we? I'm at point six on the outline. I hope you listened to those readings that Ros brought us from Romans 8 and 2 Peter 3. They are both about waiting, weren't they? We're waiting with eager expectation for a promise to be fulfilled that one day we will dwell face to face with God. We're waiting for God to send his son Jesus back to judge and redeem and restore the whole universe. Even as scoffers say, well, you can't trust a word God says. We're in the same boat as Abraham, aren't we? Waiting, waiting, waiting. And I think for two reasons we need this revelation from God at this point. Uh, On the one hand, there is a revelation of the character of God. God is kind, generous, wise, just, fair. God intervenes for the good of people, even those who don't know him. God is patient and gentle. God judges sin and shows mercy to the sinner. 
God is unbelievably single-minded in keeping his promise. Through any circumstance, through any matter of times that I decide to take matters into my own hands for the benefit of his creation. And then there's that second revelation, isn't there? Because we're just like Abraham, aren't we? Oh, Abraham's just like us. We wilt under the pressure of waiting. Remember those words from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. I promise to give you all that you need to be my people as you walk devoutly before me. That's a promise, isn't it? And we wait and we wait in matters of work, in matters of leisure, in matters of family, in matters of relationship, we wait. And God has got that promise and we still wilt, don't we? Because maybe I need to take matters into my own hands. Even as the people in the community of God, we struggle with that waiting. And the strain of waiting is seen in our wilting. Those two revelations side by side, God's character, my character. And then in the middle, a great reassurance because the pattern consistently is that God alone will do what God promises. God's word never fails. In my rebellion, I'm dependent upon him to do anything about his words. And in that sense, the strain of waiting can be removed, can't it? Because really it's not up to my hands. It's up to the God who speaks and he will do exactly as he promises. God will do what he promises in his mercy. And that mercy comes to a climax in one of those descendants of Abraham, one of those numerous descendants of Abraham, a man who never wilted. Did you notice that about Jesus? He never wilts while waiting. Uh, One of the things that was raised with me last week was how could Jesus wait for 18 years working as a carpenter before he started his real job? Uh, Really, while he was working as a carpenter, that was his real job because he was doing it perfectly, wasn't he? That's an example of him waiting for God to bring about his promises. As Jesus began his public ministry, the devil gave him a very clear opportunity to take matters into his own hands, didn't he? Really, Jesus, this suffering son of God business, a bit rough. Why don't you express your godness this way? And what does Jesus do each time? He doesn't wilt, does he? He trusts that God will do as he promises. There in his public ministry, he feeds 5,000 people and the people come to him with a crown and say, we want you to be king. What does he do? I'm just going into the wilderness to pray. And he doesn't wilt under the waiting. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Click his fingers and legions of angels will come down and rule the world. Yet not my will but yours, he prays. And he waits for that moment. Here then is the mercy and grace of God at its highest point. The descendant of Abraham who did not buckle or wilt under the pressure of waiting. And who benefits? We benefit, don't we? We benefit. And the strain of waiting can be removed because Jesus did not buckle. And so we wait for his return, don't we? With this assurance, it will certainly happen. And the promises that God has made will certainly take place because they will happen by his hand and not mine as we wait for the man who did not wilt to return. Let me pray. Father, thank you that Jesus didn't buckle. Thank you that he didn't wilt like his ancestor Abraham. Thank you for that picture of Abraham. As someone mentioned to me this week, Father, one of the great things about Genesis 20 is the reassurance that we are just like him and you are just like you. Father, thank you that you are consistent and faithful and do exactly as you promise. Father, thank you that under Jesus this comes to fruition. Father, please sustain us.
in this as we wait for him to return. Amen.